city will continue to grow. 73 citizen riots. Come and get us! Throw out your weapons and prepare to be judged! Judge this! Court's adjourned. Great. You're a legend. You were my finest student. Under arrest. What's the charge? Murder. The evidence has been falsified. Guilty as charged. I am not the law. I am the law. You want chaos? The sentence shall be life imprisonment. I'm the chaos. Thread? Let me crush him, Paul. Excuse me. We're not together. It's not for this council to play God. Who says politics is boring? Welcome to They Called This a Movie, testing the strength of friendships one terrible movie at a time. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and other podcast services by searching They Called This a Movie and find us on Twitter and Instagram at TicTamPod. That's T C D A M Pod. We are also now a proud member of Geek Vibes Nation, and you could find them at GVNation.com. Welcome back to They Called This a Movie. This is Anthony of Devlecchio. With me, as always, is Dan Aquino. Say hello, Dan. Hello, friends. Yep. Uh, this week, we do not have Mark. He is busy uh, moving on with his life. He's got a new apartment, so we wish him the best of luck and that all set up. I'm not going to do a joke about how he died, as we usually do when someone <laughs> well, misses when an you, episode. When you said he's moved on with life, it made it sound like, yeah, he's kind of got, he's not doing this anymore. He's, he's moved on to bigger and better things. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, he, he's more than welcome <laughs> to do so if he, if he feels like he's outgrown us. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Listen, without us, he's nothing, all right? He needs us. I know he did mention that he was going to, if he could, he would trade us in for Joe Rogan. So I don't know. I don't know if that happened. I haven't heard an announcement. We'll that have to would listen to the Joe Rogan episode. show. Oh, man. I That would be the first Joe Rogan episode I listened to, I think, if Mark Myers <laughs> was on there. <laughs> so we'll have, to to about his, we'll have to listen to his terrible takes on uh, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> it's, with Mark, it's gritty. Fast and Furious, and that that's all he'll talk about with Joe Rogan, assuming. <laughs> all right, uh, Dan, as we do every week, what do you watch this week? All right, so before I get into the big one, I, I want to ask you, Ant, have mm-hmm. you ever watched Love is Blind on Netflix? So I believe the first season came out right at the beginning of the pandemic, and we watched season one. Okay. So yes, the the long the short qu- answer to an already long answer is yes, I've seen it. Okay. So I'd never really watched it, but over the weekend, uh, this was kind of my in, my very first introduction to like trash TV because I, I mm-hmm. tend to stay away from it. I was uh, I was in hook line and sinker. I was <laughs> I, I I'm yelling at my TV. How could you say that to this woman? She's beautiful. This- <laughs> These guys are trash. All these guys are trash. All of them are trash. Um, yeah, they're, they're, there's this one woman who's kind of taken the world by storm now. Her, her, I think her name's Deep D. Uh, she's, uh, she's an Indian woman, gorgeous woman. And she was she fell in love with this guy, Shake. And he's just an absolute monster. And I think what scared me was I see some of myself in this guy. And <laughs> it really, it gave me pause. And I had to kind of, okay, really need to 
turn my life around here because I'm I'm dangerously close to what this guy is like. So I'm cur- okay. I'm curious now. So what is it? What is the personality trait you oh. you are identifying in him <laughs> that you're like? Mm, I, okay, it's putting a mirror to you that you don't like. Yeah. So I, how am I gonna? I have to paint myself in a good light here. Oh, all right. So essentially, this guy was very he he had a woman who was way out of his league, but he chose to like humiliate her. Not, not I'm not saying I humiliate anyone, but the way he would just go about talking to this girl was just like he didn't know what he had in front of her in front of him. I mean, so he was like he was very objectifying and stuff like, oh, you know, like she's nice, but she's not hot. And uh, I kind of see her like my aunt and all that. So the way he spoke to her, I was like, you know what? Sometimes I talk, I I, I get broy, and I'm, most of the time I'm joking. But I was like, yeah, I really kind of need to, I need to like do some reflection here because I it's scary when you see yourself into someone like that. You know what I'm saying? So sure. I was like, okay, and I, I was like looking at Jen. I was like, that that's kind of like me, isn't it? I was like, meh, a little bit. Okay, yeah, I gotta. This was my epiphany. This is my waking moment. So, I it's upsetting that I learned something about myself from Love Is Blind, uh, but it sure. potentially saved my life. <laughs> sure, and I I think it's very grown up thing to admit is that you you recognize something that um, that you hate on somebody else and you recognize that it's something that that you're doing as well. Most people would probably not see it, right? Right. They would just be like, oh, this guy's an asshole, and then. Their, their wife or their significant other just staring daggers at them. That That's you, goddammit. How do you not see the parallels? But yeah, I, I was watching this guy. I was like, man, he, he totally blew it with this this awesome woman. And I, I, I'm going to tell you something right now. And you can make fun of me if you want. I don't think you are because you're you're a good guy. There's, there's a scene in this show. You know, you know the whole thing, right? Like they're going to get married and whatnot. Yeah. So it's at the wedding, it's the wedding day, and Jen and I are kind of talking about like, oh, he's going to say no to her. He's going he's gonna to break, break this girl's heart. But she said no to him, and she was like, you know what, I'm choosing myself. I'm better than this. And just like, yes, y- yeah, you go, girl, kind of thing. <laughs> and, and I'm going to tell you, I got choked up a little bit. This, this is so powerful, this, this woman. I'm so happy for her. And she could have ended sure. up with a guy like me. And that's that's even worse. So I, from now on, I'm going to be anti-shake. I got to change my life around. But, um, yeah. yeah. The, the only thing I really remember from season one was there was this one woman that was obviously like she was really infatuated with this one guy who was like super handsome dude, like typical, like generically handsome guy, like okay. six pack abs and everything like that. And he picked somebody else. So she wound up like uh, I think she first like was proposed to by another guy. And she was like, oh, you're really nice, but I'm not really into it. It was like hoping for the other. She thought the other guy was going to propose and then the other guy didn't. So she like mad dash scrambled and accepted the proposal of this other guy. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. (laughs) So so they wind up seeing and he's a good looking guy, too, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, but not like the super obvious like chris hemsworth ryan reynolds type of good looking guy right and he was younger he was like 24 and she's like in her like early to mid 30s i think i know exactly who you're talking about yeah and they're they're engaged and she just wouldn't leave well enough alone with the other guy like she was just obsessed with the other guy who was engaged mm-hmm. to the other woman right and it was and it was pathetic it was so it made her look so pathetic. Uh, yeah, it, it, and she she kept leading the other guy on like, no, I love you, man. Yeah, you're. I love you. Yeah. I'm going to marry you. And this the whole time she just kept talking about I got to get this other guy somehow. Yeah, like oh. the other the other couples had paired off and they and they were ha- the other couples were like having sex. And like she was just like, no, we're not. <laughs> yeah, like I'm really right. not. I'm really not there yet. And the other guy was like. All right. Uh, yeah, he was he was trying his best to just be like a true gentleman. Yeah. Oh, it was it was brutal to watch. Yeah, that's what I remember from that first season. So this has now become a Love Is Blind podcast, right? Yeah. We're, yeah. We're, what yeah. what the real test would be if they sprinkled in true 
unattractive people, right? There's never like unattractive. Is it? There's never. They might be TV unattractive, like they're mm-hmm. like sixes in the real life. But I want to see some twos. <laughs> that's that's what. <laughs> it's like uh, like almost like like mystery date sort of thing. Sure. Where like oh, there's a dud in there somewhere. Sure. There's a mill house. You know. You got the dud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know what? And I would be the first person to. I would. I would go on there. I'd be that dud <laughs> for for science. You know, for science. Yeah. Yeah. Just like, all right. Well, this is who you end up with, and uh, see how it goes. But now I'd have to hope that I can make them laugh. Right. Yeah. And so then you're not a dud. Exactly. And here's here's the thing. It's like the whole beauty is skin deep kind of thing. But mm-hmm. with love is blind, it's that's that's not it. Because when they so they're talking to to each other. But then when they see each other, it's like, oh, shit, well, I was not expecting you to look like that, so now I kind of regret this. Uh, it, it happens a lot, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. This Again, I'm just, I'm really nervous that I saw so much of myself <laughs> in this one guy. Oh, he he asked the women, like, kind of roundabout ways, like, how much they weighed. Oh, like, no. oh you know, <laughs> yeah, it's like, if we went to a concert, could I put you on my shoulders? <laughs> And I'm um, like, that's something I would ask, and that's not good. <laughs> it's like in the office when he, when, <laughs> when Michael is trying to get set up, and then Phyllis is like, oh, I have someone for you. And then he's like asking her, he's asking, you like, could she fit in a rowboat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And oh, man, again, I just, I had to do some deep, deep inward thinking and inward reflection. And that was, uh, Ooh, that was an eye opener, man. I'll tell you that. There you um, go, man. If I, love is blind is good for one thing, I ho- this is it. Yeah, I gotta gotta treat my lady with respect. She she's my deep D, I guess. Or she could just <laughs> she'll be Jen, so she'll yeah. just stay Jen. Um, but other than that, I, I watched Worst Roommate Ever, which is uh, again pretty wild stuff on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, it's a few stories about people telling their uh, accounts of people that they've roomed with. Some are murderers, some are just con artists. Pretty wild stuff. Uh, nothing out of the ordinary, I guess. And the big one is uh, the Batman. I went with Jen to see the Batman yesterday. Uh, well, today is Tuesday. Uh, went to see it on Monday. Took the day off and went and saw this three-hour-long Batman movie. And Great! Yeah. Did you have any revelations about yourself <laughs> while watching the Batman? Uh, I, I was very proud of myself. I knew all the riddles. There you so go. That was pretty cool. And not the ones that were just in the previews. I knew mm. the other ones that they were talking about. Um, so I guess I'm the Batman. Can we, I guess so. We could say that, uh, man. Uh, so I'm not going to get into spoilers here cause I know you haven't seen it, Ant. Yep. But hopefully this weekend. Okay. That'd be, yeah, that'd be cool. And we could all talk about it. And, uh, yeah, I, I will say. I think this movie has the best opening scene of any Batman movie I've ever seen. It's not perfect. Everyone out there saying it's perfect, it's not perfect. It has a few flaws. I'm not going to say it's, you know, nothing terrible, but it, it's noticeable in my opinion. Time, not necessary. Probably could have shaved a half hour off. Sure. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I think you're going to like it, Ant, but... It's not again. Everyone like the Dark Knight is shit now. Like no, I to me that's still having a day to think about it. I think the Dark Knight is, uh, is is the better of the two. Interesting. Yeah. So everyone just needs to calm their tits. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I I know that this was built up so much, and it it lives up to the hype. I'm not gonna say that. I'm not gonna say it's not living up to the hype, but. Again, it's there. There are certain things that this Batman clings to that every other Batman movie clings to. So mm-hmm. it's like, okay, this has been already. This has been rehashed, and the, the acting is really good. There is there's a dynamic that I didn't really I didn't like, uh, and we'll, we'll get into it more when you see it, Ant. But mm-hmm. yeah, there, there was something that it could have been better. I thought, and it kind of suffers from the Return of the King a little bit. Uh, and it, I'm sure you know, kind of know what I'm getting at with Return of the King, with, uh, the fall sandings. Yeah. So, you know, at a half hour, with a half hour left, I kind of thought they were wrapping up. And I, I looked at my phone, I was like, oh, Jesus, they still have a half hour. And <laughs> yeah, so th- there was a couple of ending points where I thought, okay, yeah, that's a good ending. But no, there's more. Like, ah, all right. Well, I really have to go to the bathroom right now. So 
let's wrap this up. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I liked it. I highly recommend you seeing it if you are. It's not even a comic book fan. If you if you just like good crime mysteries, thrillers, got good action in it. It's a good movie. Good. good. I'm glad to hear that. Great. Yeah, I'm hoping to see it this weekend, but we shall see. As for me, didn't watch a whole lot. I watched one movie and a couple series. We started the Dropout on Hulu, which is the story about Elizabeth Holmes starring Amanda Seyfried. It's pretty good. It's interesting. She's really good in it. Um, part of the Elizabeth Holmes portrayal is the voice. She does a pretty good job at the voice. I don't know if you ever, if you know anything about Elizabeth Holmes, Dan. I, I do not. So Elizabeth Holmes is this, how do I describe her? She's a Silicon Valley entrepreneur who tried and failed miserably to create a device that would be in your house that would test your blood. So it would basically uh, remove the necessity to go to a lab or a doctor's office in order to get your blood drawn and tested. Okay. Um, and it failed immensely. Mm-hmm. They couldn't get it to work right, but they, in the process of trying to get it to work right, they lied to investors and they cheated tests and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So she's, <laughs> you know, a fraud basically. Um, But her persona, her public persona, and it's debated whether or not it's real or it's put on, is that she has a very deep voice, like talks like she's got a Batman voice. (laughs) (laughs) Essentially. That's awesome. Um, So it's it's a so they only dropped the first three episodes. I think that's how Hulu usually does it. Um, And it's interesting. It's uh, a fascinating story about all the all these stories of like these these people that are just con artists and frauds are, mm. are always fascinating to me because yeah. it always, it it's always like they have like it doesn't start off as a fraud it's like they just believe too much in themselves yes it's like they're just lying until what they're offering comes to fruition and it's just to buy themselves more time and that never happens because they don't read the warning signs of like hey you're not putting in the real work that you need to be doing and this is going to blow up in your face and they're like no 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 no. i just i just need more time and it's like i it's there you guys just have to be patient and then like blows up right like with fires festival and uh who else uh the we work guy and it, this uh, inventing anna and a sword inventing anna yeah oh man very it's... similar stories I love it's it's huge now, right? The the whole yeah. con artist like genre has kind of blown up. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I, what's it called? It's on Hulu. It's called the Dropout. Yeah, Dropout. and it's on okay. Hulu. And yeah, I'm yeah. I am fascinated with that stuff as well. Yeah, because you're right. It, like... They in a way, what's the the old George Costanza? It's not a lie if you believe it. Right. Right. So they to themselves, they're 100 percent telling the truth. Mm-hmm. But. It's, yeah, yeah, they're, they're missing that one piece of the puzzle that gets them all the way there. Yeah, yeah, it's just, they, and how they justify it to themselves is pretty is always oh, pretty fascinating. It's hilarious. It, like, I was again with the we watched Inventing Anna and just how she was able to con like these captains of industry, these Silicon Valley bros. It's fascinating stuff. I wish I had that kind of drive or that kind of persuasion skills. Yeah. Because, I mean, I'm too chicken shit to do anything like that. <laughs> and I would get caught immediately. Because <laughs> right, someone yeah. would ask me one question, like, all right, so what is this? And I would, I, uh, well, I don't, uh, you know, I'd just stumble. I would, I have no, <laughs> that's as far as I'd get. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's it. But yeah, that's, that's good. I do suggest that one. And uh, the only other thing I really watched this week is I watched another Zoe Kravitz movie. Not the Batman. I watched on HBO Max, Kimmy. How is that? That looks interesting. It's okay. It's like a like a six and a half. It's okay. a story about uh, she's like an agoraphobe and she does like tech work for like an Alexa, essentially. And then she winds up hearing something while she's listening to the recordings. Uh, she's trying to fix. So like what she does is she'll go in and she'll fix like you're trying to play a certain song, but. Alexa's not picking up what you're asking. Mm-hmm. So she'll go in and she'll fix it so that the next person that asks the same question of like, oh, play that song, but didn't play, it'll play. So oh. while she's going through her workload, she hears something that sounds, you know, like a 
a possible uh, assault or something like that. And it goes from there. It's okay. interesting. It's like a, a thriller sort of Steven Soderbergh is a director, but it's interesting because it was, uh, it was either filmed during the beginning of the pandemic or like shortly after as it started to cal- calm down. Cause it COVID does play a somewhat part of it. You do see people walking around with masks on, okay, which is always weird. It's something probably I'll never get used to seeing that in movies. Yeah, that's that'll become definitely part of like the nomenclature, right? Yeah. Question yeah. for you: mm-hmm. What do you think of Zoe Kravitz as an actor? I feel like I haven't seen enough of her to comment on her acting ability. Okay, I was just yeah. curious. I, I, I mean, think she's gorgeous. Oh yeah, she's I, that whole like gene pool is ridiculous. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. They they shouldn't be allowed to be that good looking. Essentially, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and cool, right? <laughs> right, right. It's you have all this talent. You have this talent. You have the looks, just the sexuality. There's just that shouldn't be allowed. It's you live life on cheat mode at that point. <laughs> I, I, I think again, yes, yeah, she's she's absolutely stunning. I'm not quite there yet with her as an actor. I don't, and I don't know what it is about her. Sometimes I think she's a little wooden. Okay. At, at times, but I just I haven't softened up on her yet. I remember she's been in X Men First Class. She was in Mad Max Fury Road. She in one like the Maze Runner movies. I think she's in the Divergent series. Di- yeah, Divergent. That's what it is. I've seen her in the Divergent series and and the Batman. Okay. And yeah, I just I always kind of feel like I'm getting the same type of performance from her. But I'm, I'm just, I was just curious to see what you thought of her. Yeah, the only thing I've ever actually seen her in really was, um, oh, what's that? Pretty Little Lies? Is that what it's called? The HBO show with Nicole Kidman? Not Pretty Little Liars. That's the ABC show. Big Big, big Little Lies. Lies. Yeah. Big Little Lies. Yep. Big Little Lies. That, yeah. Um, and she's okay in that. She, she's she got a smaller role in that compared to everybody else. So okay. um, I'm not sure. Is it is it maybe her voice? Is she a little more... She got like that Scarlett Johansson kind of deadpan delivery. Yeah, it, 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 not a whole lot of emotion. Even when she's showing emotion, there, you don't mm-hmm. see the emotion. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, yeah, it, she's. I think she's a good Catwoman. I think you'll like her. Uh, but yeah, I just. I, I don't. I think she. It's definitely a little bit of the Scar Jo. It's like getting by on the sexuality part, mm-hmm. where it's like I know I'm hot. And that's kind of I could let that do a lot of the heavy lifting for me. But yeah, sure. I, I, but I'm not saying she's a bad actress. I think she's a good actress. But I, I'm just not there with her yet. You're not sold on her just I'm yet. Not, I'm not sold on her just yet. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to th- like I, I I didn't feel like her her acting was a standout in Kimmy one way or the other. Okay. So yeah. she didn't like excel movie or and she didn't like ruin the movie. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She was solid in it, I would say. And, and she's still young, obviously. What she's probably what thirty? I think she's in her early thirties. Yeah. Yeah. So she's gonna get a ton of roles. Uh, so we're gonna be seeing a lot of her. I'm assuming. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I. I think. I, I. I think there's still some room to grow there for sure. But yeah. I. I, I was just curious what. And I, I think. I think you'll have somewhat of a similar uh, opinion of her when you see uh, Batman. Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. curious. This that that was the thing I was kind of looking at. The it was obviously her and Pattinson that I was looking mm-hmm. at the most because Dano, you know, like Dano's a good actor. I, I felt pretty pretty well about Dano. Uh, Jeffrey Wright is awesome. So the, the the two were the two question marks were Kravitz and Pattinson to me. Gotcha. Cool. All right, that's all I got. So we are going to take a quick break and we are going to play some ads and you guys are going to listen to them and we're going to be back in a second. And welcome back. Now it's time to get into this week's movie. And this week was Dan's pick. So, Dan, why don't you tell us what movie you picked? Sure. Uh, I'm going to get right to the point here because I, I feel like this movie doesn't really need an introduction. Uh, this is this is one of the one of the bad comic book movies. This was a comic book movie before we hit the Golden Age. And, uh, I picked the 1995 Sylvester Stallone vehicle, Judge Dredd. And uh, right off the bat. I'll tell you what it suffers from, Ant. Mm-hmm. It suffers from not being thrashing because that movie was <laughs> awesome. And uh, this is the yes. anti-thrashing. 
Well, let's just spend the rest of this episode talking about thrashing again. Yeah. I had <laughs> one uh, my one of my coworkers actually messaged me over the weekend thanking us for getting them onto thrashing. So <laughs> that that was our good deed for the year. Great. I'm glad someone else has watched thrashing now, and it's because of us. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it, it was a hidden gem, and yeah. This is not a hidden gem. Hidden, not even a hidden. It's just a pile of shit. <laughs> have you seen this before? I have once before, okay. and I saw it. Uh, I saw it in high school. Didn't like it in high school. Didn't like it when I saw it yesterday. <laughs> I didn't like it even more yesterday. Okay. Yeah, this movie again. Like I know this was pre, you know, pre Iron Man, pre the whole MCU. Uh, I mean, pre Blade. If we want to do that, pre pre Blade, Spider Man, X Men. Um, I don't know exactly what this was going to be or what they wanted it to be. Mm-hmm. I guess they because comic book movies weren't profitable yet, so yeah. I don't know what made them take a chance on Judge Dread. Uh, but yeah, it obviously uh, would like a decade later, more than a decade later, the Carl Urban Dread would come out. And I, that must have been what 2010, 12. 12. So, 2012. 2012. So almost two decades later, the the superior version of, of Dread comes out. So go see that 100% instead. But yeah, it's... I mean, this movie doesn't even really have the makings of a good movie. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, you have Stallone, who's very hit or miss. Then you got Rob Schneider, second bit. My God. <laughs> like, you, you just take a nosedive immediately... <laughs> with those two, right? You got Stallone, Oscar Oscar winner, and then you got Rob Schneider, Adam Sandler, you know, fluky. Uh, Armand Asante, Diane Lane, obviously solid. Uh, Max von Sydow, good, legendary. But it's it's such a it, it's such a missed it, it's it's a missed opportunity here. Yeah. Uh, so this is my first time seeing this, and there are things I hate about this movie. Sure. But I don't know if I hate this movie, if that makes any sense. I don't love this movie. I think I will never watch it again. No, I I don't think it's worth the hate. You know what I mean? Right. Like, it's not worth our our time to be angry at it. Yeah, it's like a composite of 10 or so better movies. I don't even know. Like about it's got that. it's got Robocop in it. It's got Blade Runner in it. It's got probably probably make an argument for. 10 or so movies that we've watched on this podcast. <laughs> All these kind of post-apocalyptic movies feel the same. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of like Hell Comes to Frogtown feels very similar. Only when they go out to the scorched earth. Yeah. Right. Johnny Mnemonics feels very similar. I felt I got a little it's all, element in there. Yeah. It's all kind of like a gumbo, a cosmic gumbo, if you will. Yeah. Of uh, And then this movie is it. Um, Rob Schneider is is the worst part of this movie <laughs> easily it, it's it's so easy to pinpoint where the weakest link is in this movie it's it's him it's the fact that they don't justify his existence in this movie at all right because he's supposed to be a hacker and there are moments in this movie where a hacker would be useful like when the motorcycle malfunctions all the time rob steiner but i just reconnected a bit bit, bit about and now now it works now we could fly and have this rip off return of the jedi speed speeder bike chase scene Uh. yeah absolutely (laughs) and also the this movie is just yelling that's what this movie is it's it's sylvester stallone yelling it's armando sante yelling it's rob schneider yelling everybody yeah. else <laughs> and there are also other points where like schneider seems like he's making he's about to make a valid like oh uh mom a valid point that causes judge dread to have like like something that you had while watching love is blind like an inner uh, looking in to see like self-reflection mm-hmm. basically right of like yeah you know we're on this pri- we're both on this prison carrier to the penal colony and you're saying the law doesn't make mistakes then why are you here and then that point gets th- thrown completely out the window for the very next action set piece right or then when he keeps saying you know i'm the i i don't i am the law it's like no you're not you're not the law anymore 
and then just says like, nope, now we're gonna run into this uh, exhaust system. Never mind that that moment that could have been <laughs> self reflection for our hero. And the point of the movie seems like it doesn't realize it's a it's trying to be a satire, right? Because I think this movie is pro fascism. <laughs> it's borderline at the very least, right? Right. J- Dread does not sol- save the day by doing anything but doing things that he's done. Like he's right? programmed to do, essentially. Yeah. yeah. He's done. He he saves the day by doing exactly that. Right. And there are parts of this movie where it feels like it wants to be that RoboCop conversation about, you know, corporatizing uh, the police force, mm-hmm. you know. Right. Having the, cor- the police force serve. Uh, the billionaires and it feels that way but it misses it misses it somewhere it forgets that that's what the point is supposed to be along the way yeah yeah. at the very (laughs) end pretty much right because yeah so you know dread saves the day and one of the 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 judges is saying yeah we got to rebuild the system you should handle it like no i'm a street judge no you you missed the point god damn it it now is <laughs> now is the time where you build up the new system so that this corruption isn't there anymore. How do you right. miss but that? He ha- but he hasn't learned that lesson though. Exactly. Dread. It's Dread hasn't learned a single lesson throughout this whole thing. No. He's just back where he was at the beginning of the movie. Right. Yeah, it's it's infuriating how they because <laughs> they wanted it to just be a generic action movie, right? You right. don't need to learn yeah. anything. It's just kill the bad guys. Yeah. The other thing that made no sense to me in this movie is how Dread and uh, Rico, Armand Santi's character, are brothers, and they look nothing alike. But yeah. they just constantly talk about, like, yeah, we see th- there's a there's a resemblance there. You have the same DNA. Why did they not just have Stallone playing dual roles? Oh, that would because he's not Jean Claude Van Damme. <laughs> right. Yeah, that he had that market <laughs> cornered. <laughs> yeah. If this was a Jean Claude Van Damme movie, one hundred percent, it would be two Jean Claude Van Dams. I would watch a Judge Dredd movie with Jean Claude Van Damme, and you could barely yeah. understand what uh, Stallone is saying. Saying, "Yeah, right? he's constantly yelling, I am the law,' but you can't. The, the way he says it, it's it's almost as it's like a blender. He's blending <laughs> all of those words together. Yeah. Uh, it, it, introduction. So. Not too long ago, I mentioned how the Batman has one of the best introductions in in any Batman movie. Mm -hmm. This movie has one of the worst introductions of your main character. And it's him. He basically talks, I am the law. He he talks very stilted. Yeah. What is he at the beginning? At the beginning of the movie, he kind of like he just saunters in. Right. They're getting fired upon. This whole block is under arrest like <laughs> did you that's not is that how you really talk it's not how a normal human being talks yeah yeah it's there are a lot of issues with yeah. this movie but i'll tell you one thing uh in the fight at the end when hershey and dr hayden are fighting oh they're kicking each other's asses i know where this is going please they said uh dr hayden calls hershey a bitch <laughs> right and then Hershey says, that's Judge Bitch, and beats her up. <laughs> yeah. So we have two named ca- female characters that have had a conversation with each other that do not in- does not involve a man. Mm-hmm. Judge Dredd passes the Bechdel test. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. It, yeah. It's, uh... They call each other Bitch, <laughs> but it, it counts. <laughs> yeah, two strong female characters interacting it's with each other. Not great. Not great, but it works counts put it on the board <laughs> it's a uh, very progressive judge dread um <laughs> speaking of the fighting scenes every fight scene kind of felt like the run through they just shot the run through sure. where there there's a scene where stallone takes a swing at asante and mm-hmm. oh it's the anyone could have dodged it you or and i could have <laughs> clear he telegraphs the shit out of his punch and he he kind of does a wrestling punch where or like he's going to close line the you know you throw the wrestler against the rope and yeah you're gonna you swing over the top of the guy's head and that's what right. Stallone did he just did a huh, over the head clearly <laughs> like missed by a foot <laughs> like this is so lazy <laughs> everything about this movie is lazy yeah and I I was uh 
how how funny was Stallone's catchphrase in this movie? I knew you'd say that. Yeah, we, we, all the kids would say it in school. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. I knew you'd say that. It caught on like wildfire. <laughs> it, it was yeah in the nineties. It was what's up, and I knew you'd say that. Those were the two big catchphrases <laughs> of the time. Yeah, caught on. Yeah, definitely did. <laughs> At least, at least Diane Lane looks great in this. She's yeah, she's awesome. Diane Lane. Yeah. Do they? They. Sh- she kind of disappears for the second act of the movie. Yeah. And that's a big problem because now the second act kind of revolves around Schneider. Yes. And Schneider is awful. He's no Diane Lane. They just. He's no Diane Lane, and he doesn't. He doesn't. He's not useful in any way. <laughs> he's he's semi useful at the end. And... Right. He finally proves. Why he's a hacker throughout this entire movie, right? Because then he rewires the ABC droid, which is actually not a bad design. That's a pretty cool looking droid. Agreed. I thought that was some cool practical effects. Um, yeah, I kind of wish they had shown a little bit more of that. Um, yeah, I think you you touched upon the one scene where Dread and Schneider uh, with Fergie. I didn't know his name was Fergie for some reason, but so Dread and Fergie are are. Uh, trying to get back into Mega City One through the shoot, and mm-hmm. the the uh, the exhaust fires off. Wouldn't it have made more sense to have him hack the exhaust pipe? Yeah, right? like they're like, oh, I can bypass the, the the valve here to have it shoot out a different one, and you know that'll guy that'll buy us more time. And I was like, no, we got to do a stupid run and fall scene. Yeah, why does he fall? Reason, and he he looks like he's <laughs> running in quicksand. <laughs> yeah, I thought there was something wrong with his feet or something. <laughs> right, what were they running in? Or like he was wearing like like weights on his on his ankles or something like that because he's he's not running particularly like someone that's done it before. Uh, Danny Cannon directed this, so it, did Cannon just tell them pantomime running? <laughs> yeah, I think I, I don't know. Like even like he trips over his own two feet. It's so stupid. <sighs> And they talk about, all right, so you have 30 seconds before the exhaust hits you. And they're running. He falls. You're dead. That's it. There's no going back. Yeah. Of course. Well, they, he shot He shot a hole in the in the ground, in the floor. So they never actually made it all the way to the end. Oh, okay. So they probably they just slid end. down like a chute. Yeah. yeah. But I feel like Schneider's character, 100%, you have to kind of replace with some sort of character that is the antithesis of dread right yes these guys they're stuck together he's got to be like part of the revolution right sure i think that's a good whoever this whoever this character is to because you need you need if there's a judge dread too what is he gonna do just kill more people like (laughs) there needs to be a character there's no character arc for dread and that's part of what that's kind of what you're missing in this to make this a actual movie is that he the there's this it, this character needs to be the the voice of reason and telling him like because Di- they try and do it with diane lane's character of like hey you know you got to show emotion sometimes it's okay to, to do that and he never does no they <laughs> like is it showing emotion although guys showing anger is anger is an emotion emotion. (laughs) that's true so so just when you say men are an emotional men are angry (laughs) (laughs) so uh the the second movie dread does a good job of what you're talking about and they they pair dread with a rookie cop like a rookie judge and Mm -hmm. so you have dread who's very stoic and very by the book you know this is how the law is It, it is not up to interpretation and the rookie is kind of is, is is trying to grapple with the whole with what the system is and crime is like and she's she's just not on the same level as him so there's that good dynamic of she's still she's learning from him he kind of learns something from her at the end where Correct. the law is not always there there are certain things that are a little gray here and there and it, you so you have the the viewpoint of the grizzled veteran and the, the uh, you know the, the the newbie. Yeah. Here you don't have that. You just have a bumbling idiot with the guy who is is super serious, and that's not fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm picturing like someone that's like using their hacking skills to like infiltrate this this system that they're doing, mm-hmm. and then you know maybe it, you know going back to Zoe Kravitz, a Lisa Bonet type, you know, 
Maybe it's a woman. Maybe it's someone super cool like Lisa Bonet sure. <laughs> teaching him about why his existence and why his fascist plans to just kill everybody and let God sort them out is bad. And then like at the end, Armand Asante, he's like, he's getting ready to shoot Armand Desante or something like that. And like, you know what? No. And Armand Asante is like, you're I'm going to kill you judge dread. <laughs> and then someone else shoots him. Maybe there's an arc about Diane Lane. Who's like, it's not, maybe she's, the one that's like you know we got we got to try and reform what we do we can't always just be killing people and at the end she kills exactly she's not a great message (laughs) not a great (laughs) message but it's an art right (laughs) but that's the that's perfect because you could have diane lane's judge hershey kind of be anti uh anti-violence where right because she because she she already has that part of her character where she she's like sort of a lawyer right yeah. she, she acts as his lawyer in this so then she, she maybe she's campaigning though these people need to be brought before some sort of due process or something like that right. you know like diplomacy before violence yeah and, and then at the end she, yeah she puts that she puts one right between armand sante's eyes yeah and it, and then that's the whole arc like yeah you know diplomacy you, you, diplomacy first but uh, when all all uh, avenues have been exhausted. You kind of have to. You kind of have to resort to violence. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a much better arc. I. I think. Yeah. You get a. You get a better hacker in there, like you said, Lisa Bonet. <laughs> if we wanted to go back to hackers, we could get Angelina Jolie in there. Uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> either one. Ooh, a hack. A hackers Judge Dredd crossover. <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> hack Mega City One. Um. Yeah. I would. I think that's great. And yeah, you need someone to teach Dredd essentially just what he's doing is not the the answer yeah. yeah again this is 1995 action nothing's learned nothing gained did you have fun getting it <laughs> you know shooting everybody that's all we care about <laughs> yeah uh, and that works for con air but like a movie <laughs> which it's which is obviously wrapped in a uh a satire's you know coding you know right. it's it, it's uh, it's obvious that someone read the comic and completely mis- misinterpreted oh. of what the meaning was. I, I I had that written down where at the you know, at the very beginning of the movie the the opening credits is and it's kind of strange because the opening credits is the Judge Dredd comics but like this movie is self aware yeah. of Judge Dredd then right yeah so it's kind of fourth mm-hmm. wall breaking but yeah so you, you you see the covers and the panels of Judge Dredd and if you like Judge Dredd that's that's all you're getting. That's the closest you're getting to a, a, a faithful Judge Dredd. It's yeah. the opening comic. Yeah. This movie, this is the movie equivalent of the Punisher logo on a police cruiser. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just completely missing the point of what the, the Punisher is. Uh, and it, it's, it's always funny because most of them, yeah, I'm not going to, we're not going to like delve into the whole thing, obviously. But a lot of the police would be probably terrified of the Punisher. Because that's what he goes after. Yeah, criminals and corrupt, uh, corrupt uh, officials. Yeah. So you know, again, right over the head. But uh, yeah, I, I think you, you bring up a good point with Con Air, where that movie there there is no underlying message. Really, it's just it's the story of a man trying to get home to his wife and kid who's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. This this is you, you have all these people stuffed into this city, and they think the the way to keep order is to have these these judges who can just go out and dole out punishment left and right but you know it's kind of a mirror of today's society in some in some aspects yeah. uh, clearly that's not working so <laughs> they, but they don't tackle that they don't tackle it <laughs> no. at the end of this movie the system has not been taken down no the it's system is not reformed in any way it's been destroyed but it's going to be rebuilt and it's like yeah. clearly they say that yeah. So ju- so it's it's actually not dissimilar to RoboCop, but RoboCop knows that that's a shitty ending, you know? Right. That's like RoboCop is like, yeah, it's fucked up that this hasn't been solved, but what are you going to do? This one is like <laughs> this is is like Judge Catch Judge Dredd and the sequel, watch him kill more people. Right. He, he might as well. Dredd should have just walked away and said it. And that's the end of that chapter. <laughs> it's like they arrive at the same conclusion, but with very different attitudes. Yeah. 
Oh, 100%. Um, yeah. Yeah, Dread comes away. Again, it's just like, yeah, hope you had fun. <laughs> <laughs> just Wasn't that a romp? <laughs> You like when I threw that guy off the building or, you know, <laughs> blew this guy's head off? That was fun. Rob, we had, remember that time, kids? Rob Schneider saying something funny, everybody. <laughs> I, oh, I, I hated... He gets shot towards the end. He mm-hmm. gets shot, and he's still, like, cracking joke. Yeah. Like, God damn it, dude. Just You can't stop for one second, can you? Yeah. So, Judge Dredd from 1995 is directed by Danny Cannon, who directed this. I still know what you did last summer on a bunch of television, including Gotham and Pennyworth. Stars, so that's just alone. Armand Asante, Rob Schneider, Jurgen Prochnow, Max von Sydow, Diane Lane, Joanna Miles, Joan Chen, and Balthazar Getty. Has an IMDb score of 5.5 and a Rotten Tomato score of 22%. Budget, $90 million. Wow, 1995 that's, money. Oh, wow. That's a lot that's, of money. That's criminal. Yeah. Someone but... should go to jail for that. Because <laughs> you know why? It doesn't show. No. It really doesn't show where it needs to. Yeah. Box office, $34.7 million domestic, $113 million worldwide. So Yikes. it's barely profitable. Uh, depending on the marketing, you might there might be another $20 million in marketing in this. So Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yikes. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember hearing, you know, and this was always one of the, the movies that was kind of brought up to show comic book movies can't succeed. Mm-hmm. Right. This this was kind of shown as you know they're, they're poison pills, uh, and I didn't know why. Other than you know you see it, but I didn't realize it it tanked that badly. Yeah, it's a lot of money for 1995, 90 million dollars. It's a summer release, June 30th. Yeah. So that that's you know prime time. Yeah, uh, that's my birthday weekend, and I did not go to see this movie. <laughs> and it's you know what I, I'll give it this: it's a crisp. It's like an hour thirty. Yep. Uh, it it doesn't drag so much, but it's again the, a lot of the acting choices, the the the, uh, the casting is woefully misplaced, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I, I think we can agree with the majority of that. Yeah. Um, also, it's such a weird dynamic, and I, I'm sure this is how it is in the comics. I I haven't really read any Judge Dread, but you, you spend your whole life as a judge, and then you retire. They kick you out of the city. <laughs> yeah, that's a shitty retirement plan. Yeah, be be lucky that uh, you don't retire in in our world, right? <laughs> I, I like again. Dread does such a better job of everything from like A to Z. It's Mega City One feels way more crowded, way more dangerous. Uh, the blood factor, like the action, is is way better. It's shot better. Lena Headey is in it. It's, she's far better than Armand Asante, his villain. It, it's a very simple story they're not bringing in like we're taking over the system it's she's a drug dealer who like rules with an iron fist she murders anybody that she comes across just ruthless and now it's just these two cops are essentially stuck in this building it's and it's an escape movie essentially it's done so much better and i don't know how you you fuck that up yeah yep so you want to get into the plot yeah let's do it all right, what do you got for us? Okay, so I'm going to give a quick shout-out to our friend Tia, her friend Brittany. They have a podcast called The Top Ten with Tia. They also have another podcast called Coffee Break with Tia. Both could be found on Geek Vibes Nation. Go to gvnation.com. Follow Tia at TC underscore Stark on Twitter. Brittany at Itty Bitty Brit. Check them out. Give them a follow. Good people. Uh, Tia also writes for Geek Vibes Nation. She's the head writer, so go check her out. Okay, great. And we are going to take a quick break and you guys are going to listen to some messages from friends of the podcast. And we will be back in a second. Hey, this is Ken M. Padawan Jay. Coach Duffy. From the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour podcast. Every week, the ODPH is talking sports, movies, TV, comics, and more. It's always a parlay of topics on each episode. You can find the ODPH on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, and wherever you find great podcasts such as the one you're listening to right now. Don't forget to check out OchoDuroParleyHour.com, where you can find the links to all of the ODPH social media accounts, links to the bands whose music you hear each week on the show, hashtag 607 podcast info, and parlay points, our companion block section of the show. Thanks for listening to the ODPH. Now get back to your regularly scheduled podcast. Welcome, travelers. Seems like you're looking for a story. Well, I got one for you. It involves adventure, friendship, 
It all hey, sorts hey, of... Hey, uh, Earl, why don't you tell him about that time I stole that big-ass melon? Yeah, yeah, I, I was going for more... Or you could tell him about the time I kicked your ass, Earl. I wouldn't ever tell him Do I need to get time. my ref gear on? Okay, everyone, shut up. Now come with me as I tell you a story from afar. Hey everybody, my name's David. I'm the DM for From Afar Podcast. A From Afar Podcast is all about four friends separated by distance, brought together by adventure. Hope you all stop by and give us a listen. Thanks. And welcome back. Now it's time to get into plot four, Judge Dredd. We open on a bunch of Judge Dredd comics as the credits roll. And then we get a scroll as James Earl Jones, for some reason, tells us about how the world went to shit in the third millennium. In order to combat the rise in crime, a law enforcement agency known as the Judges were created to both uphold the law and to dispense punishment. A cab. Then we see a prison transport spaceship transporting a new group of prisoners into a prison city, including Herman Ferguson, played by Rob Schneider. So here's the here's one of the problems with this movie. It makes it look as if Rob Schneider is going to be the focal point of this movie, mm-hmm. right? Because you get him coming off of the the transport carrier and. It's like, all right, yeah, we're following him for a while. It's like, all right, so we're going to be, he's going to be like the main character here. And Dredd is kind of going to be not not secondary, but he might not play as big a part, you would think. Right. And that sucks. I don't want to, I don't, the first thing I see, I don't want to see Rob Schneider. You want, you don't want to see that in any movie. No, not at all. Not even the hot chick. I was going to say, even a Rob Schneider movie, you don't want to see, you don't lead off with Rob Schneider. That's, that's not good. You, you bat him eighth, ninth, probably yeah. not ninth. Cause you don't want him to turn the lineup over. <laughs> you put him like seven, eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Herman gets assigned to Y block, then gets put in another shuttle that takes us through the future version of New York city. As we know, because the city has grown around the Statue of Liberty gets dropped off in a neighborhood called heavenly Haven, which must be ironic. And, uh, so I, w- I I think I'm a little confused about how he enters this. So is he getting released from prison? I, I think, yeah, it's like he served time, essentially, right? Okay, yeah. I What I was on, I thought he was like on probation and he was serving time in what is Heavenly Haven. But I guess I, I was just misunderstanding. No, he he's being sent to Heavenly Haven. Right. Right. Because he's because that's where he lives, I suppose. Or I guess it's like a halfway house. Our version of what a halfway house is, like a relocation program, I guess. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah like a halfway house. Yeah. And Heavenly Haven is currently in a block war. Herman gets dropped off in an apartment, and he gets accosted by what I assume is his roommates, including James Remar, who all have guns. The riot outside is getting pretty intense, so two judges get called in, but are immediately overpowered, so they call in backup. Judge Dredd himself. I'm thinking about the reveal again. <laughs> I like how silly his costume looks. Yeah, that is one thing. The costume is is lame. Yeah, he looks like <laughs> he kind of looks like a, a, a kiss reject. <laughs> he's got the platform boots on. He's got like yeah. a cod piece. <laughs> yeah, and this big shoulder strap on. It, it's so gaudy, right? Like that shoulder piece. Yeah, the gold. The gold eagle, right? Yeah. Oh, it's so gaudy. I, mean, I get that's how the, he looks in the comics, but my God, it's 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 not. It doesn't help your movement for sure. <laughs> yeah. Because if you have to if you have to lift your arm up, you're only lifting it as far as that little piece takes you, right? Right. Exactly. It's gonna stop you dead in your track. <laughs> <laughs> so Dredd starts swinging his dick around the neighborhood, screaming out that he is the law, and that tells everybody to put down their weapons. But Remar doesn't and even shoots at Dredd through a window, telling Dredd to come out and get him. So Dredd and the other two officers enter the building, and Dredd immediately murders around 10 people. <laughs> I, I did like the gun. The yeah. gun's cool. Yeah, how yeah. he can change the ammo uh, voice active. It's voice activated. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, automatic fire, grenade, uh, stun or whatever. It, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. So one of the judges, other judges, thinks, hey, shooting suspects without due process looks like fun. A cab. Me next. And then barges into another room and is immediately blown away in a hail of gunfire, losing his gun as he stumbles back into the apartment hallway. One of the thunks picks up the gun at the judge's gun before Remar can warn him that it's booby trapped. And that thug is then electrocuted to death by the gun's defense system. It's actually a pretty competent scene of world building as we get to see how the judge uh, judges operate. And the sort of technology they get to use is Dread cycles through a number of different settings on his gun to neutralize the threats. 
After he neutralizes all but Remar, Dread reads Remar his all his charges, which includes 20 years for resisting arrest. One of the thugs tries to shoot Dread in the back, but is killed by the other judge, Hershey, before he can. And then Dread reads Remar's final charge, the murder of a judge, which carries the sentence of death <laughs> as he blows away Remar. Uh, it, <laughs> it's uh, he, when he reads it to him, Remar says, let me guess, life. <laughs> and Dread shoots him, no death it's it's so <laughs> corny but again it's 1995 right it's stallone yeah you expect that cheesy one-liner yeah uh, absolutely i i wish i part of me wishes when we've talked about this he wishes those were still around <laughs> the sweet one-liners yeah the sweet one-liners i i wish they would they'd make a little bit of a comeback but i i know the, those days are gone long gone yep unfortunately it's when men were men <laughs> didn't have to worry about this pc culture <laughs> kill kill a dude and just say something really badass and and it, like you're absolved <laughs> he, did, was he supposed to kill him no but did you hear what he said that's pretty, pretty badass a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah that that's imagine playing that at a trial it's like yeah you know uh dread you're uh you're being charged with the murder of 10 civilians uh how do you plead like, did you hear what i said like check out my <laughs> check out my recording. Oh no, yeah, yeah he's, you're good. Not guilty. <laughs> yeah. So after the crime scene is cleaned up and they take away the dead judge, Hershey takes off her helmet to reveal it's Diane Lane, who blames herself for the judge's death. But Dredd says the dead judge made the mistake and she shouldn't beat herself up over it. To which she tells him it's okay to show emotion sometimes, and he says emotion should be outlawed. Toxic masculinity, right there. <laughs> yeah, that's now he he's. Uh... He's completely walling himself off, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. If you're Diane Lane or if you're any woman, that's a huge red flag. Yeah. Right. You, you they have out. absolutely no chemistry. It comes and, out of nowhere, right? Yeah. They're yeah, they're not really super into each other. Doesn't feel like no. But I guess it's refreshing. You know, it, it doesn't always have to be fucking going on. It is Although until the end. Yeah. Because she kisses, she, him, she kisses him, him and it's like, where did that come from? That wasn't earned. Yeah. And then Schneider does cock block him at one point. Oh, well. At, in the apartment. He just shows up. Yeah. He's like, hey, guys, I'm Rob Schneider. <laughs> That's all of his lines should have just been that. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, what are you doing here? I'm Rob Schneider. <laughs> we yeah. need to, we need she to gets, hatch this. <laughs> she gets drier than the Sahara, and he and he is just just super limp after that. <laughs> he, he should. He's essentially a Pokemon. <laughs> go, go get him. Rob Schneider, Rob Schneider. <laughs> Uh, Stallone's uh, Dred's dick turns into an innie when he shows up. <laughs> like you just you hear when he's he's getting ready to kiss Diane Lane, you just hear that like ping sound from the crotch, <laughs> like the cod piece. Yeah. <laughs> and Rob Schneider shows up and she's like, Meow. you 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 get the trombone. Yeah. <laughs> or like a an airplane like crashing. <laughs> 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 Oh, that would have made this movie so much better. <laughs> just dick sound effects. <laughs> just just uh, really ham it up. <laughs> and you know what? It, it would have fit because everybody tunes the goddamn scenery in this movie. Oh, yeah. There's not, I except think... for maybe Diane Lane, but everybody tunes the scenery. <laughs> yeah, Armand DeSante, I think, gained 20 pounds from overeating. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, look at all this entire set piece. He, it's like he eats the Statue <laughs> of Liberty at the end. <laughs> So then Dredd starts hassling a vending machine droid and threatens to shoot it, and it opens up to reveal that Dredd knew Herman was hiding inside the droid the whole time. Herman was sent to prison for hacking, and now this new sentence of hacking a droid carries a sentence of five years on the account of it being a habitual offense. So at a council meeting, chief judges start talking about the rising violent crime numbers, and the chief judges are demanding more resources and to expand executions to include lesser crimes. But Judge Max von Sydow is hesitant to do so, out of fear that more executions may make the society dip its toe into fascism, which is adorable because you are already there. <laughs> yeah, uh, cat's already out of the bag there, Judge. <laughs> Back at the precinct, Dread watches a news report that seems to insinuate the riots are planned by higher powers and then goes to see Chief Justice Von Sido. There's a super dramatic moment where Dread takes his helmet off as if we didn't know it was Stallone. <laughs> yeah, well, now, I, I haven't read... I haven't read co the comics. Does he always keep his helmet on? And this is like a big deal. 
Yeah, essentially, he's a Mandalorian. With the, gotcha. The, the helmet, it, it's essentially like die with your helmet on kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And gotcha. it, they make a great, uh, they, they make a great point in Dread. Where it's like no one's ever seen him with his helmet off. Mm. And it's like, fuck yeah, man, that's badass because you don't know what's under there. It, you know, spoiler alert, it's Carl Urban. You've seen any movie where Carl Urban is in it. That's what he looks like under the helmet. Uh, <laughs> sure. But, but it's, it adds to the mystery. It's like, that's how serious this guy is. He, right. Once the helmet's on, it's not coming off. But here, and then it's, and in this movie, he takes it off at like the 15 minute mark and he doesn't put, <laughs> he it, doesn't in put it again until the third act. <laughs> well, it's, it's almost like the Spider Man movies where Peter Parker just runs around basically without his, his mask on because. We have to see Tobey Maguire. You have to see uh, uh, Tom Holland because they're just too pretty not to look at. So I guess that's right. what they were going for here. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. And yeah it, I guess if you pay, you're paying Sylvester Stallone a certain amount of money, you got to see his face, right? Right. I, I just, I wish <laughs> you're right. Because clearly we know who's underneath the man, the helmet. <laughs> <laughs> like if you want to fool us, you know, have it be uh, who who was like who was a big nerd back in like 1995. Have it be Jeff Daniels, or have it be like, <laughs> like holy shit, it's Jim Carrey. Yeah, wasn't expecting Rick Moranis. <laughs> <laughs> Where I, that I would not have seen that coming in a thousand years. <laughs> like yeah, from the beginning, it's like I am the law, and then all of a sudden, it's it's Rick Moranis. Like hey guys, you know how's it going? How about that law? Right. Honey, I shrunk the law. Oh my god! <laughs> I made a mistake of taking a sip of water there, and uh, <laughs> nearly, nearly went down the wrong pipe. Perfect. Good Von Sido lightly questions Dread about whether the executions were necessary, and Dread says they were unavoidable. Von Sido then tells Dread that he wants him to teach ethics to new recruits at the academy two days a week, which doesn't sound like it's up his alley. I wouldn't want him to be my teacher. Yeah, no. At the Aspen Penal Colony, Warden Miller goes to see Rico, a VIP prisoner that is held behind a force field light. Rico was a judge that killed innocent people. Warden then disarms the security system, telling Rico that he has a package for Rico from a mysterious benefactor. So Rico opens it, and there's a badge, a gun, a picture of the newscaster inside a puzzle box. Then Rico shoots Warden in the throat. The Warden tries to arm the security guns again, but the shot to the throat makes the system unable to recognize his voice, so it shoots him instead. Why wouldn't it and shoot few... Armand Asante as well? I don't know. I was thinking the same thing. Right. You, you've done nothing there. <laughs> a few guards come in and try to help the warden, but then they are killed too. And then we cut to the academy where Dredd shows the cadets the standard service issued gun, body armor, and motorcycle. The motorcycle malfunctions upon demonstration, and it will never get fixed. And then Dredd talks about the only thing that counts, the law. Oh, he holds up the, like the Bible, essentially, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. This, again, this big, this big reveal. Yep. And he talks about the long walk, which I guess is the judge version of getting sent out on an ice flow, as it's the last mission of a judge that reaches old age and retires. Hershey goes to talk to Dredd in the locker room, and she tries to reach him on a personal level, but he more or less shuts her down. She asks him if he's ever had a friend, and he says yes, but he wound up having to judge him. Which sounds kind of catty. And yeah, it's a little petty. <laughs> I had to judge him. Yeah, he was wearing those the... shoes. <laughs> he was wearing the wrong <laughs> shoes. <laughs> the bodies from the Aspen shootout are shipped back to the city, and when the guards leave, Rico, pretending to be dead inside one of the bags, sits up and shoots the poor sap that was responsible for inventorying the bodies. Now Rico's walking the streets, free man. He heads to a pawn shop and tells the guy that he has a package for him. Gives him the code, and then the guy opens up and shows him the package that's waiting for him. Rico opens it and it's just judges equipment, including a lawgiver, which they call the gun. And so Rico shoots the clerk with it for no reason. Nope. And he has a really. It was in the. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I was just gonna say uh, they because it happened to the Terminator. That's... <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, they they killed the uh, the Terminator kills the gun shop owner, right? Yeah. And he has a really bad one liner here, Armando Sante. Oh, be careful. Like, yeah. What does he say? It, he he grabs. He's going to grab the gun. And the pawn shop guy, like, oh, careful, that's only for a judge. What do you know? I must be a judge. Yeah, we fucking know that, man. <laughs> that's not. Why can't this movie figure out reveals? Right, yeah. It's like, <laughs> hide, so, like, that would have been a good idea for that to be the first time we realized he was a, a judge. Right. Yeah, exactly. 
or he he could have just said, "What do you know?" And then that's it. That's all, right? <laughs> just uh, yeah. I must be a judge. We know. Thank you, Captain Obvious over here. <laughs> we just saw you do. We saw you escape one scene ago. Yep. Then Rico activates an ABC droid, which is an old deactivated droid series, and he uses it to act as his bodyguard. The newscaster and his wife are sitting at home as the newscaster is preparing to tell a story about how the system is the reason for all the crime currently going on. Then what appears to be Dredd kicks down the door and shoots them both to death and then walks out. Hershey and Dredd do a routine traffic stop and it turns out the driver is a multiple DUI offender, so Dredd blows up his car. Then a bunch of black-suited guards come up and tell Dredd that he's under arrest for murder. I had written down, what if there was someone in the car and that's what the murder was? (laughs) <laughs> like, I, I didn't murder anybody I'm like well, no there there was a kid in that car you uh <laughs> you, for, did, you, did you notice the baby on board <laughs> <laughs> for some reason you felt the need to destroy the car instead of impounding it mm-hmm. I f- again I f- he takes it way too far yeah I, so what w- he was uh what was it he the guy had multiple is it driving drunk D- or something like that duis yeah, yeah. DUIs. He had like three duis so imagine if cops did that for real today like, all right yeah you know we're, we had to pull you over because you were driving drunk get out of the vehicle they just put like some c4 on your car blow <laughs> that shit up yeah, yeah. i'm sorry that's the law <laughs> my hands are tied i think more people would probably not drive drunk if that happened so it works <laughs> i guess it's a deterrent so this movie is telling you how we need to stop crime <laughs> blow shit up blow shit up <laughs> <laughs> everything is answered with being blown up <laughs> i I think I would learn my lesson pretty quickly. Like, I, you know, I don't have enough money to buy another car. I don't want to get this one blown up. I think I'll yeah. just call a cab. <laughs> Savant Saito comes to visit Dredd at his holding cell, and Dredd denies the charges fully. Then at the trial, Hershey defends Dredd. Prosecution plays the recording of the murders. Hershey says that the video should be inadmissible because there's no way to prove that it was Dredd because the video is of low quality. You can't see his face, and the only identifier is his badge, which could be duplicated. So the judges agree. Then the prosecution then asks the central computer the details of the murder weapon and the lawbringer guns that the judges use tag each bullet with a DNA of the judge and the DNA is confirmed to be that of Dredd's. Dredd erupts at this saying, I didn't break the law, I am the law, which is just what a judge drunk on power would say. (laughs) It's a lie. I didn't break the law. I am the law. Yeah, (laughs) that doesn't help your case, man. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that does sound like somebody that, uh, you know, uh, thinks they're above everything. Right, because you think about it, in your mind, him, if, if I'm one of the judges judging him, in my mind, I'm thinking this guy thinks he's above the law because killing, you know, he, he's not being held to the same standard. He could just kill whoever. Yeah. If you're shouting out, I am the law, like, imagine doing that again in the real world. You go, yeah. right, you've killed somebody, Ant. <laughs> you go on trial. <laughs> And they find you guilty and you just stand up. I am the law. They're like, all right, get him out of here, please. Yeah. You think people would the get tr- the, the uh, get the reference? <laughs> Maybe somebody would. One of the jurors. Gotta be somebody. Like, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Dredd reference. I get that. Yeah, I like it. It kind of gives you the, like, I'm like, I see you, man. I see you. <laughs> And the tribunal confers in the back. Von Sido talks with Judge Griffin, another member of the tribunal. And he mentions that both Dredd's tur- that and he mentions that both dreads turned out to be homicidal he questions whether there's anything they can do to save dread from an execution sentence and griffin says that von sido can retire and as his last request before he takes his long walk he can ask for the tribunal to go lenient on dread and this is exactly what happens and griffin sentenced dread to life in prison at aspen penal colony so much for lenient <laughs> i would have been like can could you get me out you know <laughs> yeah. could you have me pardoned yeah. Yeah, it's like, you should have been a little more specific there, Von Saito. Right. Yeah, yeah, lenient. I, I guess it's lenient that you're not going to die. Right. You're also spending your entire life in prison now, so that's not super lenient. Yeah. He should have been more specific. He should have been like, I, as my last request, I just hope you don't sentence him to any more than a year in prison. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get it all down, man. Exactly what you want is what you should be saying, not, eh, go lenient. <laughs> it's open to interpretation. Yeah. Like his death will be quick. Great. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's lenient. <laughs> we were we were going to shoot the shit out of you, but now we'll just kind of, like, do lethal injection. Yeah. 
They strip Dread of all identifiers of being a judge, and then they send Saito out on a long walk, equipped with a gun and a duster like he's Lorenzo Lamas from Renegade. As Dredd gets processed, Hershey goes through his locker to see if she could find any evidence to prove he didn't do it. Instead, she comes across a couple of photos, one of him as a baby and one with Rico when they were younger. Judge Griffin goes back to his office and finds Rico and the ABC droid sitting there waiting for him. Griffin says that he had to kill the newscaster because he figured out the Janus project and the plan is to have Rico rile up chaos in the streets so that the council will have no choice but to turn to the Janus project in order to solve the crime problem. And Rico chews some scenery. On the prison transport to Aspen, Herman winds up right next to Dredd, and Herman can't help but revel in the irony for both of them to be on the same transport, and some of the other prisoners start to realize Dredd is who he is. Herman is still pissed that he got five years for a trumped-up charge, and Dredd says that the law doesn't make mistakes, which goes against the exact thing that the Dredd is saying as why he's in prison. And then some outlander group fire missiles at the transport, and as one of the prisoners tries to cut Dredd's throat, the shuttle gets hit and it crashes. Meanwhile, Hershey is at her apartment trying to tap into some records, but then gets her permissions revoked. I was thinking, I wish they had cut the the scene out where he meets the cannibals. Yeah. I would have liked to have rather seen him escape from the Aspen penal colony. Sure. I think that that would be a more interesting scene. And again, you could kind of bring Schneider his, his uh, quote unquote hacking ability. Like maybe you could do yeah. that. Like, oh, like I need to get back. Something's, you know, uh, he finds out Asante has been released somehow. Like, we need to get out of here. Can you get me out? Like, yeah, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll do X, Y, and Z to get us out. Yeah, but you got to get me out of here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like I'm I'm coming with you. Mm -hmm. As a group of guards searches the crash, they radio back to Griffin to tell him that there's no evidence of dread, and Griffin tells them to execute the survivors. Dread and Herman, meanwhile, got picked up by a post-apocalyptic version of Texas Chainsaw Massacre family. A bunch of backwoods cannibals plus a half-man, half-robot. Herman tries to spare himself by pretending he's a quote-unquote believer like them, but it just makes them want to eat him even more. Again, they go, pretty cool prosthetics on the robot man. Yep. Not, not bad. I give yeah. it credit. That's where $8 million went. Right. But but I take points away for how he pronounced paw. <laughs> Let me at him, paw. Let me at him. So as they go and try and put Herman on the barbecue, Dredd breaks his restraints and starts beating up the robot man. Fight ensues and some of the guards show up and shoot the hi these hillbillies and then Dredd takes one of their guns and kills all the guards. But then one isn't dead and tries to shoot Dredd, but the guard gets shot in the back by none other than Judge Von Saito, who was then immediately stabbed through the back by the metal dude. The half-robot man and Dredd fight and the robot man gets his arm that is some sort of drill stuck in the wall, so Dredd takes a cord from it and jams it into the half-robot man's back and electrocutes him. Is he back also in the city? Say, uh, I knew you'd say that in this scene yeah he does he does, he does say that damn yeah. it <laughs> what a, it, it makes no sense here <laughs> back in the city hershey is having one of the cadets analyze the pictures she found in dread's locker and he realizes that the picture is faked and that the only only thing that is actually real is the baby the background is revealed to be some sort of futuristic lab and she really tears into him when she for some reason thinks that he is looking at the wrong picture oh the, the uh, cadet yeah yeah why <laughs> i don't know it's like such a minor detail to the scene, and it's like, why is why is this happening? And, you, and you're yelling at a <laughs> cadet. This guy's not, yeah. you know, he's not a computer programmer or anything like that. Yeah. He's literally he's like, learning. Dumb fuck. <laughs> Figure this shit out, man. You're so mean to them. <laughs> yeah. The dread nurses Von Saito in his last moments, and Saito starts to regret the judge program as it's just too much power for one person. And he's absolutely fucking right. Mm -hmm. He talks about then he talks about the Janus product, the project. They took Von Saito's DNA and a few others, created two clones that were supposed to be engineered to be the best judges. But one of them mutated and turned evil. And Saito says his brother was weak, Rico. And then Dredd realizes that Rico is still alive because he must have been the one that killed the newscaster because they would share the same DNA and that Griffin was part of it. And then Saito dies. And then Dredd looks at an unnecessarily stacked statue of justice and locks and loads <laughs> to find Rico. I'm glad you noticed that too. It's just like, I don't remember uh, Lady Justice being that uh, gifted. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, her back's going to hurt, so I don't know if those scales are going to be telling, telling the right story. Also, why would they not know who Justice is? That's their whole thing, right? Are they not built upon justice? I mean, I guess that kind of... Uh, iconography has been done away with in the 3000s okay so the, the, that lady justice is no longer yeah von okay. knows. von knows but you know dread it was built in a lab too 
Okay. Yeah, that that's true. So he wouldn't have. And how old does that make Side Owl? When did Lady Justice um, become not a thing? They never say, right? Right. Yeah. So, maybe so it was, I guess it was right before Dread was created. Yeah. Stallone, I think, is supposed to be forty in this movie because I think they say forty years ago the Jazz Project started. Okay. So Side House probably sixty five. Yeah. It's got to be. I mean, Side Owl was forever. It was like sixty for like thirty years. Right. <laughs> he's he's been ancient forever. I know he he passed <laughs> away recently, but he's been old yeah. for yeah since the beginning of time, decades <laughs> since the Seventh Seal, which was the fifties. <laughs> yeah, just again, add him to the uh, the Mount Rushmore of eternally old actors. <laughs> so Griffin takes Rico to the Janus Labs and introduces him to Doctor Hayden, and they have a discussion about starting up the Janus program and bringing about a new order, a new world order, if you would, if you will. So chaos reigns in the streets as Rico sits out to kill a majority of the judges in a number of different ways. A bomb goes off at the bank while they respond to a call. Bomb goes off in a locker room at the precinct. And then they just kind of, and then they just get shot by the ABC droid that was hiding in a pile of trash, which is incredibly inelegant given the first two scenarios. (laughs) And then Dredd and Herman set out to try and make it back to the city. Dredd tells of two refugees who tried to make it into the city by going into the city incinerator, which lights at 30 second intervals. The refugees died, but it's the best chance they have to get back out of the city. Not that uh, Herman is a hacker or anything. Right. That could have come in handy. Hershey almost gets blown up by a bomb on her bike, and the council calls a meeting and have, uh, as they have ha- had almost 100 judges have been killed. So Griffin suggests bringing Project Janus to- live to solve the problem. Meanwhile, the incinerator, Dredd, and Herman get ready to time the incinerator, but Herman tells Dredd he has to apologize to him because it's his fault and he's that he's in this situation. But he doesn't apologize, and they make a run for it. For some reason, Herman falls in the path, and Dredd has to pick him up, and they wind up going down a chute and wind up back in the city, falling on a hill of gravel. The council gives the central computer the authority to engage Project Janus. Meanwhile, Dredd knocks out one of the judges and takes his uniform and equipment. And the council learns that from the central computer that it will take eight hours to create a clone from the Janus program. So then the other council members out of nowhere get cold feet and want to stop Griffin from proceeding with the program. So he calls in Rico to shoot everyone. It seems like there was like a, a conversation missing here where like at first they're like, oh, man, it's only going to take eight hours to get these clones. And then they're like, we can't do this. Right. <laughs> you skipped a big step, right? Yeah. It'd be it'd be different if it was like it's gonna take twenty four hours and be like oh that's okay yeah I think because that gives you plenty of time to kind of deliberate and you know figure out what's going on eight hours that's that's pretty quick to create a full clone yeah yeah I, I, and I, I don't like this entire idea anyway of the clone army essentially uh, sure well you're in luck because they immediately drop it as soon as Alan Santi get jump falls off the top of the statue of liberty that's right yeah because well, they 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 awake the clone they awaken the clones too early right they wake the clones up but a bunch of them are awake and like are creepy looking yeah they're like and they wake up they're like mummies yeah and then then we just we cut to the top of the statue of liberty and it's like oh well that will get figured out <laughs> off screen yeah <laughs> no worries nope and again like that's the end of that chapter yep it's again i think the play here is to have it be dual roles from St- stallone right and yeah basically all right so they're they're gonna maybe start doing the janice project but he obviously he doesn't get to awaken the the clones and you have that right. kind of standoff with who's the real dread oh yeah it's like the island yes and i, I don't know how you would fi- I guess you could figure it out by their interpretation of the law. I don't know how you would figure it out, though. How do you come to the conclusion of who the real dread is? In this movie, it's just they one of them blows the other one away. Yeah. Uh, yeah th- I don't know. I, I don't know. This, this is a head scratcher. Because <laughs> like, the, the last third of the movie is just dread and, and Rico yelling at each other. Yeah. Right? They're just hamming it up. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, you know, you get a very disappointing third act. Yeah, definitely. So after knocking out a judge that takes off Dredd's helmet, he storms into the boardroom and comes face to face with Rico, whom he thought was dead just a few hours ago. Rico runs and Griffin calls for judges, saying Dredd killed the council. Shootout ensues as Dredd and Herman make their escape on the flying motorcycle, shooting through the wall for an escape route. Chase ensues on flying motorcycles as judges are in pursuit as Dredd and Herman struggle with their malfunctioning bike. 
which would have been a good opportunity for Herman to show his worth as a hacker and all, but the movie never does so. The chase is essentially the return of the Jedi speeder bike chase, but in an urban setting, and eventually Dredd and Herman get away. Really bad green screen they had, in that scene. <laughs> yeah, there is. Yeah. And they head to Hershey's apartment, which is in disarray. And then Hershey pulls a gun on Dredd, telling him she doesn't know who what he is anymore and whether she can trust him. So Dredd tells Hershey that Rico is his brother and tells her that the reason why he doesn't show emotions anymore. And Hershey says that Janice didn't do that to him. That's all Dredd. She's right. And they almost kiss. Yep. And they almost kiss. But then Herman comes in a cock, block, cock blocks and Herman unsuccessfully tries to find out where the Janus project is located. And Dredd says it wouldn't be on any computer system, but they should look for power surges on the electric grid. And Hershey mentions that she saw a huge power surge near where her cycle got blown up near the Statue of Liberty. Again, what's the point of having Schneider around? Nothing. Right? He can't even find what? the goddamn project. Yeah, that's it. He that should be his part in this plot. Right. Like being plan. being able to get into the project and stall it, right? Yeah. So everything with computers should be him. It, like, oh, it, computers, let me handle exactly. this. There should be a scene where Dredd and Rico are fighting it out, and Schneider has to, is like hold away in a room where the giant fucking killbot is trying to break in, and, and Schneider's like trying to shut everything down. That, there should be a scene mm-hmm. like that, but of course there is no scene like that because that would be too good. Yeah. Yep. At that moment, Rico trashes the DNA samples for the Janus program and replaces them with a fresh sample of his DNA to go off of. Much to the dismay of Griffin, Griffin tries to stop Rico, but the ABC robot grabs his hand while he pulls a gun, and Rico commands the robot to rip his arms and legs off. Dredd and Hershey and Herman make their way into the Janus system, and while they argue whether Herman should stay behind, the ABC droid pops up out of nowhere, grabs Hershey, and then shoots Herman. Fortunately, he doesn't die immediately. Dredd returns fire on the robot, but to no effect, and then Rico and Dr. Hayden show up, and Rico orders Dredd to drop the weapon, or the robot is going to snap Hershey's neck. So Dredd drops the gun, and Rico brings Dredd into the lab to show him the clones. Rico then tells Dredd they could either turn the clones into judges, or they can let them be free humans. Dredd says he should have killed Rico himself when he had a chance, and Rico goes on and on about how Dredd judged him. And he was the only family Dredd ever had. And he was creating a revolution against a corrupt system. We don't really 100% know what Rico did besides killing innocent people. We don't know what the, what the situation is, what the context is. Right. I, which would have been good. Yeah. Right. You don't really learn too much about Rico other than he's just a psychopath. Right. And that he's a clone. Right. Like that that takes precedent over what he did, which would have been a good opportunity again to be like, if he like he quote unquote mutated and instead of being a good judge he became like this revolutionary yes i think that's a way better arc yeah I mean, like he's the reason why the like the the poorer area like kind of started the revolution yeah like he he basically um uh, he galvanized the the, yeah. the poorer areas and maybe he's the hero right like the 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 innocent people the quote unquote innocent people he killed were judges that were carrying out fascist regime you know sure fascist orders yeah i think that would have been an interesting right because now it, it brings up there's a moral quandary there for dread right because yeah. he sees like what what rico is doing now is wrong but his intentions it's almost like a thanos thing right where mm-hmm. he thanos wants to save the universe but he's doing it ass backwards right so you, right. you can kind of, you can understand, you know, all right, well, human beings suck, so we should absolutely get rid of half of them. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> but why not just double, you know, the resources or triple the resources, X, Y, and Z? But yeah, so that would be, essentially, he's he's getting ready to create a, a, an army of revolutionaries, I guess. And right. they're going to turn out to be insane, potentially, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So... Rico wants Dredd to join him, but Dredd says he'll have to kill him because there's no chance he's joining him. So Rico calls in the ABC droid, who's still holding Hershey by the neck, and tells tells it to rip Hershey's limbs off, but then decides he wants the droid to rip off Dredd's head first. Then the ABC droid starts to freak out, tosses Hershey aside, and slaps Rico to the ground, then Dr. Hayden, and it turns out that Herman has reprogrammed it, finally justifying his existence in this movie. Hershey tosses Dredd Rico's gun, who runs off, 
but not before he tells the central computer to hatch the clones, even though they're at 60%. So Dredd starts shooting at Rico and the lab equipment, and Dr. Hayden and Hershey start fighting and calling each other bitch, which I think means this movie technically passes the Bechdel test, and the clones start waking up for no reason. Not for no reason in this movie, anyway. Right. Rico tries to make an escape and makes it to the top of the Statue of Liberty, where they have a fist fight, and Rico knocks Dredd off, and Dredd hangs on out the side. So Rico monologues as he judges Dredd for betraying his own flesh and blood, and his sentence is death. But then when he goes to shoot, there's no more lethal rounds left in the gun, so it doesn't fire. So then Dredd grabs the gun, sets the fire a flare, which goes off in the statue's head, causing Rico to get distracted enough for Dredd to toss Rico over the side to his death. I, I like how the, the climactic fight is just Dredd getting lucky. <laughs> right, he, he lucked out that there was no more, no more lethal rounds in the gun. Yep. Basically, yeah, it all comes down to luck. Yeah, so that anytime your hero has to rely on that kind of luck, it's poorly written. Yeah, but you know what Billy Zane says? Real men make their own luck. Real... <laughs> yeah. that's right. That, that's one of the things that you've always said that stuck with me. I think for it, it'll stick <laughs> with me for life. And I, and I we were much younger when you brought that up. And I don't know why, but it's always one of those things that'll forever just be like, oh, that, that line is so epic. I mean, it, it comes from a douchebag, but yeah. it's pretty. Well, it's a, it's saved, a good line. Save that poor little girl. So he, yeah. That's all I'm saying. So some people's uh, <laughs> villains are another person's hero, I guess. It's true. As Dredd tries to climb up, Doctor Hayden shows up with a gun ready to kill him, but they get shot in the back by Hershey, who then helps up Dredd. Then we get a weird uh, fade in, fade in, fade out. As Dredd and Hershey leave the statue, a battalion of judges are there. The recruit that helped Hershey with the photo says the central computer broadcast of Janus Project, so the whole secret has been exposed. And Herman is still alive, unfortunately, getting medical attention. And now, and now they want Dredd to be the head judge, but he says he's a street judge and suits up in an ar- in armor and helmet. Hershey gives him a kiss and he rides off on a bike. And that's the end of Judge Dredd. What a stinker. I think I hate it more now than i did earlier in the episode because you had to walk through when it, i said right? i didn't hate it yeah, yeah. Right, and we unpacked a lot of things i was gonna say because you unpacked the whole fascism thing and their inability to really tackle the root problem mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah their, their solution to the problem is just violence yep let's get more violence in here <laughs> it, it's it's almost like with if your house is on fire we're just gonna burn the, the house across the street down yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's not great. No. Now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> no, it, a lot of problems. I didn't hate it while I watched it, but there are a lot of problems with this movie. It's very much a product of its time. It's yes. it's the mindless action movie where you're not supposed to get a a message, essentially. Just watch the hero blow away the bad guys with this poorly contrived plot. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, again, have you seen Dread, by the way? I have not actually. I would recommend watching it, especially after this. You, it's it's like Godfather compared to that. Uh, <laughs> man, it's poorly. It's poor dialogue. It's poorly casted. Poorly shot. Uh, the action isn't good. It's just there's not a whole lot to be proud of it for, <laughs> right? I mean, like, what can you sure. sit back and like? Okay, the the robot looks cool. Uh, there's some interesting prosthetics. But other than that, like, what, what would you point to, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a fair point. I don't know. Yeah, it, and it, it's, a, it's a miracle that comic book movies kind of survived movies like this. Yeah. Right, because any number of movie executives could have simply just pointed to Judge Dredd and like, yeah, well, we're not taking a chance on this. Yeah. $90 million bath. Oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, Schneider's lucky that he's, he uh, attached his star to the right wagon. Yeah, right. Because, oh boy, <laughs> he's easily, in a movie of bad things, he's easily the worst part of it. <laughs> yeah, and, definitely. And I'm not, I'm not even trying to come across it as like, because of how, you know, he's portrayed nowadays. Mm-hmm. It's, he's just that bad, people. He's very grating in this movie. Yes. Like, he just doesn't shut up. He makes his presence known at all times. Yeah. It, and it's yeah. just pointless. He's, it's a pointless character. Mm-hmm. Yep. So... That is Judge Dredd. Um, That's going to wrap it up this week. We have our St. Patrick's Day episode is coming next week because St. Patrick's Day will actually be on Thursday. So look out for that. We got some special planned. 
we usually do, but uh, be sure to check that out. I think we'll also be announcing our uh, movie picks for March movie of the month, which will then go up as a poll the week after that. So we'll be talking about that next week as well. And uh, I'm pretty sure Mark will be back. Yeah, perfect, perfect week next week. So be sure to check that out. Uh, that's going to wrap us up this week. Movie this week was Judge Dredd from 1995, directed by Danny Cannon. So for Dan Aquino and Mark Myers, even though he's not here, this is Anthony Davecchio telling Danny Cannon, well, you certainly made a movie, didn't you? Thanks for listening to They Called Us a Movie. Subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to check us out on Twitter and Instagram at TicTampod. That's T-C-T-A-M-Pod. You can also check us out on TikTok at They Called Us a Movie.